Okay, I think we have a quorum, so uh, we'll begin. Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, for those of you who were not with us on Monday, we're gonna just recap a little bit of what we did and to get back to sort of how we got where we are. Um, so just a quick reprise. Uh, the whole idea here for this two-part session was to really introduce everybody to storytelling as a design system, as a way of actually getting work done and, and specifically focused on, on two pieces, your, your destination guest experience and, and your brand. And those two are very, very interrelated. Those, those kind of are flip sides of the same coin. Uh, and we want to talk a little bit about once you get that story going, you know, how are, what are ways you can think about translating that story into action? What's it look like on the ground? Uh, so that's, we spent a little time Monday kind of going through um, a presentation on how we do that in our work and, and offering some ways that we wanted everybody to think about doing that in your own work. Um, at the end of the session on Monday, we gave everybody a homework assignment. And today, uh, hopefully, we'll be about sort of fulfilling that. We, uh, and we'll, we'll share that in just a, a second. So, so we just uh, wanted, to, wanted to start with where we began. Um, so a few summaries really about where we ended up the other day. One is the premise that, and we have some great data, and you probably have even better data than we do, uh, the destination leisure industry, and specifically the cruise-driven destination leisure industry, will be back. And all indications uh, are that we'll be back strong. Some of it's very, very uh, quantitative. As you know, the booking pace in 2021 and 2022 is, is quite strong. Uh, the other stuff is anecdotal. When we go out and look, we do a lot of primary research in our work. People are tired of being at home. Um, they're going to get even more tired of being at home. They want to go someplace. They want to get out. There is a gigantic sense out there of pent up demand. Um, and, and that's great because the first thing they'll do is as soon as they think it's safe, they're going to come back. So our argument is um, because of that, uh, likelihood of, of things returning in a very strong way, um, it is a really good time right now to think about your brand and your guest experience. This is a great time while a lot of us are, are a little bit offline to, you know, to really sort of look at, um, you know, how, how we might retool, how we want to think about things differently, make some changes we've been wanting to make for a long time, perhaps, and really examine the business and, and see about making some improvements so that we're really ready to ride that wonderful pent up demand wave uh, when it comes back. Um, we coined a phrase called destination performance and I'm gonna share that model with you again in just a second, just to remind everybody what we mean by that. Um, but the key to that is really beginning with this compelling distinctive story and, and we're all about that today. So, so we won't belabor that one too much. Just a quick note again, for those of you who didn't join us, um, in our view and in our practice, stories, when we use this word story, we really mean a very specific thing, something that has characters in it who have a plotted experience over time with lots of good detail and emotion, a really strong sense of setting in place and time so we know where it's happening, um, and, and a distinctive voice, a storyteller, right? When, when you read a book, you're, you're listening to the author's voice. When you see a movie, uh, you, you might think you're listening to the actor's voice. You're really not. You're really listening to the director's voice uh, and a little bit the screenwriter, depending on how well they get along. Um, so stories are very specific and we, we really mean a story. A story is not a bullet point list and it's not a strategic plan. You know, it really is a narrative with a beginning, a middle and end. It is a once upon a time, something happened. Uh, and finally, our premise is, and it's the premise of our work, but we, we'll, we, we believe if you try this even on your own, you'll find that it's true a really well-constructed story that's well understood is, is a great foundation for, for experience design, for improving what really happens with a guest. Just in summary, again, we went through quite a few, uh, quite a detailed dive into some sensibility about what might be happening in this next, this next reality. We call it World 5.0, but this is the summary stuff. So very, very important as we go forward into this new world, that we all really know our real audiences and that we know them as well as we can. And by real, I don't mean that you had an imaginary audience, but it could be, in fact, I'll go out on a limb and suggest it's likely that the makeup 
of your next audience may be a little different than your historical audience. There may be a rebalancing of demographics and psychographics and interest points. Uh, you may find a lot of new people, a lot of folks who've never tried you out before who are, who are suddenly willing to do it because they found out that engaging the world's important and they want to do that. And of course, you're going to have old friends who come back, but really important to understand your real audience. Uh, second summary point about the next wave here is, you know, branded distinction. Uh, we, we said this before, and I, and I promise you somewhere buried in today's presentation, I will probably say it two more times, but something for everyone is the definition of a non-brand. So we really want to look for what makes us distinctive in every single destination, every single onboard experience, every single uh, shore excursion, every single tour has those components. What makes you distinctive? Um, you know, and we, I, I think our, our Caribbean friends get tired of us because we practice a lot of our work in the Caribbean and, you know, Caribbean destinations historically have, we think, undervalued their greatest assets, which is what makes each destination, each island, each port of call really different than all the other ones. So that branded distinction is going to be critical if you want to ride this new wave. Um, you got to make it easy. Your brand has to be easy to understand. Your message has to be quick on the uptake. And when people get to you, it has to be very, very easy and non-threatening and simple for them to do the things you would like them to do. Um, that may sound a bit tautological, like, yeah, well, of course it has to be easy. But the truth is, you know, ease looks different to different people. It can be as simple as, as fixing your wayfinding and making it more plentiful. It can be uh, really a, a component of training your staff who greet your guests and interact with your guests to make sure they know a very, a very easy and, and casual, but yet hospitable way to make sure they're directing that guest to where they want to go and to find out what a guest wants, right? So make it easy is critical um, without rubbing our nose in COVID. And we're not going to do that today. We've all had enough of that, I think. Um, <laughs> but we do want to demonstrate safety. And that's different than talking about it. That's different than listing it on your website, which you need to do anyway. Definitely put, hey, we're, we're safe here, our protocols demonstrating safety, every photograph, every message, every video, all of your training, all of your design, all your physical design assets, you want to make sure you're telegraphing all the time. We've thought about you. Your safety is really, really important to us. And we've, we've done everything we can possibly imagine. And, and you know what? If you think we need to do something, please tell us. We'll be glad to accommodate you. So that, that boots on the ground, you know, clear demonstration that you care about safety and that you put that care into practice is really a key feature of, of next gen um, guest experience. And finally, uh, it's the goal of every great brand, particularly experiential brands. You know, the, the thing about a destination brand, and some of you know this, I imagine, some of you know it and haven't thought about it, but is that you, know, you can't send free samples to the mailbox. You can't send a discount coupon for them to take to the supermarket and try it out. They got to come. They got to visit you in order to experience your brand. So um, the key thing is once you get that first contact, once you turn someone from somebody who's brand curious about you into somebody who's willing to take that first step toward trial, very quickly you want them to make you theirs. You want the guest more than anyone else to own your destination. That's the place I go. That's, that's what we really want to see with guests. And again, these days you have a blessing and a curse. Uh, the blessing is we live in an age of robust, instantaneous communication. If I go to Antigua and I have a marvelous experience for an hour, every, but trust me, I'm a blabbermouth. Everybody I know, the thousands of people I'm hooked up with on social media, they all know within an hour. you got to come down here. This is amazing. <laughs> the bad news is the reverse is also true. So we have to be very careful. But Anything we can do to engender that sense of you are, a, you are now a local, you are now an owner of this destination. You know, you're, you're no longer a tourist. You're no longer a, that, that newbie. And God forbid, you're not a, you know, you, you're, you're not a visitor or anything like that. You're family. Welcome, welcome back. Imparting that sense of guest ownership is real important. All right. Why are we doing all this? Why is this important? Why does this even matter? Well, you know, our argument is this. You know, we think that you all are in this to have a successful and robust and scalable and growing business. Um, so our argument is in some shape or form, again, for those of you who weren't with us on Monday, every one of these six criteria that make up the model we call destination performance are really important. 
we want attendance and we want it to grow over time. It's really good when year over year over year, we can show attendance growth, visitation growth. On top of that, we want to compound that. We not only want more people to come, we want everybody who comes to stay longer. You know, if, if you can book a cruise that's going to overnight in a port uh, instead of last time when you just had a few hours because you loved it, that's great. You know, if you want to come between cruises and fly in and spend a few extra days because you had a great time and you want to catch up on stuff you didn't get to see, that's great. So attendance growth, length of stay increase, per capita spend, share of wallet. You know, we, we want the guests to have a great time and, and we'd like them to spend money when they're, when they're at our destination or on board our ship. So, so giving them good reasons to do that is important. Um, guest satisfaction is critical. Um, we really want that guest to feel good about their decision and feel that ownership. Um, we want them to feel so good that they come back more often. Uh, you can do the math, but if you looked at your average uh, cycle time, if you looked at your average frequency of visitation, if folks come to your destination on average once every two years or once every 18 months, if you could reduce that average to once every nine months across all your guests, that's a gigantic lever. And finally, we want that intent, back to our social media, we want that intent to recommend to skyrocket. And, and again, it's really great because when people have a great time, they'll do it. You know, they're all over Yelp, they're all over TripAdvisor, they're all over Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and we really want to encourage our guests to do that. So the point of view is if we can influence these six factors with a really well-designed destination experience packaged within and delivered to the market vectored through a really robust brand, we're doing good work. Uh, so that's really the why behind what we're, what we're all about here. All right, here was the assignment. So that's where we've been. Here was the assignment coming out of Monday. We um, presented a few examples of different types of stories. Uh, one was a, a profile for a dating site. One was a one ad and one was a, uh, a destination rental property description as just as examples. And we challenged everybody to come back today with a five or six sentence single paragraph narrative, maybe in one of those form factors that just says, hey, here's our destination or our guest experience exactly as we want it to be next. Remember, we're making up stories here. You don't have to talk about budget. You don't have to talk about schedule. You don't need to call your finance department. And you don't even have to talk about COVID. We all get it. This is in the world you really want to enter next. What is that story? So that was the assignment. And here's how we're going to work now. And we are sure crossing our fingers and hoping that some of you have some stories. Um, so we're going to need a couple of brave volunteers, maybe four, maybe five. We might have time for a little more than that. And we simply want you to volunteer to read your story so everybody can hear you. And the way that'll work is, it's real simple. All you got to do is thumbs up or wave your hand that you, you have a story you want to read here in a minute. And as soon as I see a hand raised, I will grab that person and say, okay. And then you unmute, unmute your mic, because you're all muted right now. You unmute your mic, and we're all going to listen carefully, and you're going to read everybody your story. And, and occasionally, don't be surprised if we ask you to read it twice. Um, that's not because we didn't hear you the first time. <laughs> it's because what we want to do requires us to get it in our, our bloodstream a little bit. So we may say, hey, that was great. Read it one more time. And then once you've done that, we're going to open the floor up. We're going to ask you to all mute again. I'm going to open the floor up to our ideas team, to uh, Mark and Duncan and Kelly and Charles and Jared and Cass. And they're going to do a little improvisational work in real time with that story. It is not really the depth we go to when we're doing an experience design plan in our normal work, but it's a pretty good snack. It'll, it'll give you some sense of how a story works as a driver of design. Uh, while we're online with, together today, if you do have questions. Uh, we didn't really invite them the other day because we were pretty tight on time, but today we've got time. So if you have questions, if you'll just use the chat feature on the Zoom and just chat them out to everyone and because everybody will benefit by seeing them, but that's also where Mark on my team is going to be looking and Mark will be harvesting questions as we go and, and at the end we'll have time to answer a few. So uh, that's where we're going. Uh, now, don't let this guy go first. Trust me. You don't <laughs> You don't want to hear this guy's story. So, okay. so in a minute, I'm going to punch out of these slides, and then I want to see some hands up because uh, we really would much rather hear your story than this guy's. Okay. So here we go. All right, who's got a story? Somebody, somebody show me. Okay, 
Karen Mayberry Webb. Thank you for volunteering. You are a brave woman. Where, Let's hear your story. Go? I hope I don't <laughs> regret it. Um, do you want me just to read you the story, then tell you what the intent is, and you just guess it? No, actually, thank you for saying that. Actually, we'd love to kind of know first before you read. Tell us a little about your destination or, or what you're doing, so we have that in our heads. Okay, so uh, the the story I would have written the first day would have been different from the story that I, I've written today. Um, I've been to all of the seminars, listening all about you know how the cruise lines can get back forward. But I've heard very little about the crew and just been in two groups that have actually addressed that. And you can't have a cruise ship experience without crew. But many crew now are intimidated to come back and uh, people have gone on to find other jobs and the generation and crew that we want are the age groups that generally define the people on board from the you know, early 20s through to the 50s. So I would like to uh, design an experience for the crew, um, an, an app, first of all, like one of the apps that, that you can get now, like Calm, which I've personally been using during this time. And also, when the crew get off the ship, there's two different things happening, Go, well, not happening, going to happen. One is the crew want to feel safe because they need to make sure that they're not being exposed to anything and they need to be able to go and chill out and not just go and send hundreds of emails um, from the crew seafarers center. The other thing is that the, because of the bad publicity, the, the destinations and the cruise lines, everyone's gonna be really watching them. So I think that the, the crew could get off the ship and go to a safe haven that not only offers them an experience, but also offers them some mental health break that would be really wonderful. And also from recruiting those crew to getting them on board, I've always prided what I do that it is based on that I care. That's why I started to do it. It wasn't always about money later on, but in the beginning, you know. So my story is really an, an advert for to encourage people to come to work on ships and then stay with them on their journey throughout their contract. Wonderful, let's hear it. Okay, here we go. It happened as you said it would. As I nervously sailed away on my very first ship, I went up on the deck and as the port disappeared from view, the salty wind kissed my cheek farewell. And I knew I was in the right place as the breeze whispered, have a great adventure. I proudly wore my team backpack as I left home, you know. It contained all that I needed to keep me safe. I heard your voice encouraging me, and as promised, after my first cruise, I got the opportunity to go ashore and talk all about my first week to your team, now part of my extended ship family. It's like I'm a pirate for the day, heading ashore seeking treasure. My treasure is feeling the warm sand between my toes, with no real cares for a few hours. I'm walking through that safe haven and magical garden, where random friends sit waiting to hear about my week. I get to recharge and I get back on board, full of virtual hugs and confidence, ready to be my best self for our wonderful paying guests. I'm glad I chose your company. You are my destination. My purpose enriches me. And now I'm also a purveyor of dreams because you embraced me and empowered me to follow mine. I am proud to be a sailor and that my employers care so much they gave me this day. So that's my story. <laughs> That was great. Magnificent. Great job. Very well Do you done. guys want to hear that again? That, that was pretty, I got it. You guys get it? Okay. So ideas team, uh, where do we go with that story? How do we build an experience out of that narrative? Duncan, you want to give it a shot first? Sure. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is thinking about the uh, crew member when they disembark and they are at the uh, uh, port of call that uh, they have a dedicated space uh, that is crew only, um, depending on what the protocols or requirements might be uh, post COVID or tail of COVID, we may need to keep crews isolated amongst themselves so that crews of one ship don't mingle with crews of another ship, but we would still need to give them access to um, a bar, give them access to perhaps laundry facilities, have a master sundry or shop facility where they can pick up uh, everyday items that they may need to take back to the ship. We might be able to offer a concierge service 
so that our destination is one that the crew really looks forward to going to so that they can have a shopper pick up the items that they would like to get. And those items are ready for them to pick up so they don't have to go into town if they don't feel safe or they don't have enough time. But those items can be ready for them in a, in a gift bag, just like we would have our guests be able to pick up their purchases just before getting on the ship so they don't have to lug them around for their shore excursion. But I see that there's a great way for our ports of call to be able to advertise to the crew members that, yes, you've got a lot of places that you'll be able to go, but our port of call is where you want to come ashore because we're going to take good care of you. And that way you build up a great reputation with the crew when they're going to re uh, refer and uh, recommend a parts of court call to go to your destination is going to be one of the first ones that they talk to the guests on board the ship. Very cool. Very cool. Jared, what comes to mind? The, the phrase that really struck me when you read that was like, like, I think you said like a pirate for a day. And I just love the sense of, of creating a destination that engenders a culture where when your crew member steps off board, they really feel a part of this sense of community. And, what, and that's created through, of course, the facilities, just as Duncan said, but also through the terminology we use with the crew, what we call them specifically, creating a sort of branded language to refer to them as, you know, that's distinctive from what we would call a guest who was doing the same thing. But um, to really create a special identity, whether that's a pirate, you know, you mentioned purveyor dreams, whether it's a place where your dreams come true, whatever it is, creating a place where the crew member has a, a real sense of identity, of, a, a different sense of identity about who they are when they're in a place. That's very strong, impactful, and a, a great differentiator from any other place you would go. So awesome stuff. Very cool. Kelly, you have any thoughts about that notion of culture? Yeah, I... I um... As the learning person on the team, I, I would say, uh, first of all, bravo, because um, wonderful imagery in, in your story. So I really, really love that, Karen. Um, and what that what that means to me as a learning person is you, you are helping to establish a culture in which your crew um, get to um, get to interact with the the destination uh, environments as well as with each other when they're when they're on board. So the what that says to me is the training that you're doing uh, and the culture that you want to invite uh, the destinations to have um, is something that needs to be shared out and and across because you know that you're going to be going to different ports of call and you want to establish that culture. Um, beyond just your crew, but the people that they're going to interact with. And, and one of the things that we do in destination training is just that, is to try and, and make sure that we just establish a culture that is um, caring. And that means uh, not only safety, um, but true concern for the individual um, and, and um, what the experience that they're going to have is. Hey Kelly, I don't want to put you. I don't want to put you on the spot, but could you give like a quick example of something that that comes to mind that we've done that might illustrate what that looks like? Sure. Um, we um, we years ago um, after uh, Grand Bahama Island had uh, four hurricanes in one season, um, they were pretty much out of commission, and people um, on the island were um, up and coming generations on the island didn't want to stay on the island. They wanted to leave. And so what we needed to do was to go in and, and help them to understand that, yes, this can be a wonderful environment for you. And yes, you can make money. And yes, you, you can do this. But it's, it's all about customer service. It's about knowing not only what is in your immediate, because it's such a small island, and yet people only knew what was around them. They didn't know what was four miles down the road. So being able to say there's more to do than just go to the beach, for instance, that was a, 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 common, um, a common need was to, to help them to understand not only the culture um, in their immediate environment, but to be able to share the island with the guests. Great. Thank you. Charles. I actually tuned in really closely to her, her pre-story uh, description, uh, and especially the app piece. So I started processing, if, if you have a series of, of ports of call and there is a common app that goes across all of those and those locations are putting in some of the content that Kelly was describing, but also in this post COVID world, there's always questions over what's allowed in this port of call, what are the rules? Those things can be shared, not in a team meeting, but at the cast members leisure 
you know, before they go into the dining hall the night before, instead of just looking at the, the boards in the hallway to tell you about the board, it's, oh, so Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jones, uh, you know, and your port tomorrow right here in our app, we see these things you need to be prepared for. So uh, I see using that technology combined with that, that offshore excursion gives a powerful communication tool back to the guests. Okay. Yeah, well, Duncan and then Kelly, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move ahead. Um, what, one other thing that popped up to me is that, um, and you know, one of our close former colleagues was stuck on board a ship for 50 plus days uh, because he was sailing when COVID hit. And then uh, because where they were sailing, uh, the ship was basically barred from uh, docking outside of supplies being left on the dock. And then everybody walked off the dock and then this crew could uh, take the supplies back on board. But it took him 50 plus days to return back to central Florida. So I think there's going to need to be um, a reestablishment of trust, not between the crew and the cruise line, but between the cruise line industry and its ports of call and the, the, you know, the, the governments, the civil uh, groups that are controlling those, that, um, that the crew is not going to be uh, left stranded on board those vessels should something else happen. Uh, perhaps cruise lines can share a contingency plan because if they are shut down, then the private islands that they have are suddenly now available. So at least the crew has somewhere else to go to either quarantine, you know, or once they've made quarantine, to perhaps transit off the private islands uh, to a, a separate vessel that'll take them back stateside or wherever their home ports are. But being able to return back to their home port should something else happen is going to be a big concern of people, you know, returning back to the sea if they'd experienced it when COVID first hit in the spring. Right. Kelly, you have one more thought? Yeah, um, I was just going to say that um, if you did have an app and it was uh, a crew app, uh, I think that's a really safe, ho hopefully you could create a culture where that was a safe place to share experiences, whether they um, happened on the ship itself or whether they happened in a destination, you know, um, saying, you know, this is a this is a place I found to be really wonderful. Everything was clean and they were, you know, really uh, taking care of me well. Um, I felt safe. Um, both physically and, and health-wise. Um, so having that um, that uh, crew be able to communicate with themselves um, free from, um, uh, uh, you know, a closed app, in other words. So Great. that's what I'd say. Super. Thank you, everybody. And I would just round that one off with, you know, we all know the service value chains. And, and you know, and Karen, you're absolutely spot on. It, we know if we take great care of our crew, no question about it. They're going to pass that straight on to the guests. So thank you for being first. Thank you for a great story. That was fabulous. I believe uh, we have another volunteer, Mr. WBE1. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know your name. You got a story for us? Yeah, I do. Uh, All right. Simple story about a destination. Can you tell us a little bit about your destination before you read your story? Nope. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Uh, there is a place where Imagine is not just a song by a local boy named John. It's a place where you can take a tour in a taxi named Mother Mary to visit places called Penny Lane and huh? Strut. Yeah. Uh, boy. Or imagine a World Heritage Site of a major maritime mercantile city that runs from the Royal Albert Dock with its rich agricultural history where the museums that dot the Mersey side offer a range of exhibits from the world as imagined by John and Yoko from their honeymoon bed to the horrors of the World War II Blitz in the second most bombed area in all of England. The nearby Western Approaches Museum lets you imagine the experience of an active bomb shelter just around the corner from the buildings on Rumford Place that hold the history of the cotton and slave trades that mark the British connection to the American Civil War. If your quieter tastes run more to Peter Rabbit and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, imagine the peace and serenity of a ride through the nearby Lake District with a visit to the Beatrix Potter Farm and a boat ride on Lake Windermere. As the day winds down, imagine yourself during the 60s British music invasion by taking a ferry across the Mersey with the iconic Jerry and the Pacemakers song playing in the background. And be sure to finish the day with a pint at the Cavern Club listening to a Beatles tribute band. So join me in Liverpool and imagine the day we will have. 
<laughs> well, no need to read that one twice, is there? Uh, man, I, I can't believe you wrote a story about Albuquerque. That's fantastic. That's my favorite place. <laughs> All right. I, I, yeah. if, I was, if I was a betting man, I, I bet I know who wants to jump in first, but I'm going to go ahead and pick. Duncan, you, you go ahead. You, you have peculiar insight here. So uh, the first thing that um, jumped out to me was um, uh, Liverpool, uh, much like Hamburg, being a, an international port, was an infusion of all these different cultural influences because you had sailors who were traveling around the world bringing their own different musical influences to that port city. And it was that infusion of lots of different music and uh, cultural um, uh, uh, expression that uh, influenced uh, the Beatles very early on where they were able to listen to Little Richard. They were able to uh, listen to Fats Domino. They were able to hear uh, blues music from the United States and from elsewhere because sailors were collecting those records when they were going around to other ports and they were able to you know, you know, swap them out and bring them to record stores. So I would uh, uh, think about an experience for our guests as they are coming to Liverpool that here they are being able to continue that tradition in terms of what music from around the world have you, you know, picked up that you like to listen to that you're going to bring into Liverpool to, to contribute to, to the next young group of bands that are, are, are doing what they're doing now? Yes, they didn't have the internet back then, but it's a way to let your guest suddenly walk in the shoes of what influenced the Beatles. And so as opposed to it being a more of a, a passive experience where they are there to pay homage to, the, to this great band and, and, and the musical culture that sprung from it, here they are having a different avenue to become more an active participant in what that journey might be. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, I was muted. Jared, what's up? I, I d dovetailing sort of off of what Duncan said, I love the fact that this is not just a, you know, a, a better version of a, of a museum or a historical tour. You are literally living the sites that influenced you know, the greatest musicians that ever lived, in my opinion. So I, I, I love the fact that you are, and, you, and it's also a, a very strong opportunity for a good story arc, you know, you, it, it, it's a very sort of planned dynamic when they arrive you know, you sort of you sort of see where where the origins began, and then as you go on, you see how those origins developed into the music that that these four guys created. Um, and you walk away at the end with a full sense of sort of the story that they lived and how you can continue that on. And I love what Duncan said about um, you know contributing to the next generation of musicians because there's still certainly an opportunity for that to be a hotbed of musical creativity. So from a narrative standpoint, that is just a genius concept. Bravo, sir. Great. I, I as he was describing that, I was picturing all these people who are putting on their cosplay uh, costumes, and as they embark in the city, they're all dressed as their favorite musician uh, and role-playing parts of parts of those lives, you know, themselves and, and living that moment for themselves. Excellent, Duncan. Um, I, you know, uh, trademark and copyright aside. Um, the tour that you were uh, uh, describing, there were a lot of things that I would not have thought of right off the top of bat with a port of call to Liverpool. So, you know, offering a, a, a suite of magical mystery tours where yes, you're gonna get some Beatles, but yes, you're gonna get some other things that are mysterious or that you didn't know about Liverpool so that you are walking away with a more complete experience and making it a bit of a game for the guests so that you know, you've got seven or eight of these magical mystery tour buses and they're all off doing their own things, which are very distinctive from each other. And then we're all bringing those experiences back on board the ship. And now we've got all this conversation. Where did you go? What did you get to see? Let me see your pictures. We did this. Suddenly dinner that night is, you know, is, a, is, is alive with people talking about the different experiences they had. Excellent. Kelly. Yep. I would just like to say um, that uh, setting uh, which is one of the elements of story, is not just about the place, but it's also about the time. So you have a, a wonderful opportunity to port people through time, if you will. Um, and as Duncan said, you know, looking into the future. The other thing would be to think about um, the songs, not just the, the, the bands, but the songs and the characters in those songs. I love the idea of having a cosplay. I love the idea of having uh, people in the 
in the destinations as part of the tour, whether it's your guests or not. Um, I don't I don't know if you can get them to dress up. That would be awesome if you could. But definitely you could um, encourage the people who are giving the tours to become a, a character from one of the songs and or, um, you know, what is happening in the song, uh, in the in the story of the song itself to be able to um, help to create that again uh, for the guest. Cass, what you got? I, I just want to say, I think this particular experience lends itself extremely well to um, another option, which is a virtual walking tour where this could be, you know, app driven, where you might have music that plays that leads into story. And it kind of goes from some, from track to story from track until you get from each place to each place for those that, you know, like the backpack that like to walk, that like to, you know, walk in their own groups and do it at their own pace. I think this lent itself so well uh, to that type of experience. And, and, and the time out the app with interactors so that, you know, if, if you start the tour upon uh, ship arrival and, and, you know, at the scheduled times, you're going to encounter interactors at the key locations that align with what you're seeing on the app. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, you know, um, that, I don't know, how do we clean up with everyone that's called to make this excursion happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you send Mark a note, we'll follow right up with you, trust me. I, I, as the brand guy in the crowd, I guess I have one thing. I would, he would be delicious for me. I would just love to build a whole, a whole brand charter around the notion of Liverpool. It sure ain't London. I mean, I just think there's a whole lot, particularly for Americans who, let's face it, you know, and I, for my fellow countrymen, and I'm sorry, but most Americans don't know where Indiana is, much less where England is, and much less the difference between London and Liverpool. So, you know, I think you could really have fun taking a brand like that and making it exotic and you know, making it a big magnet. So that was a great one. That was a great one. We, we have, Duncan, you got a parting shot? Yeah, I was just thinking because I started going through my head in the Beatles catalog and obviously it's Liverpool, so it starts with the Beatles, but there's lots of other bands that, you know, came out of that, you know, uh, the, the, you know, uh, uh, the Midlands, it's not just Liverpool. I mean, you can go over to Manchester and Oasis. I mean, there's a lot that can happen there, but obviously this is just Liverpool for, for this particular port of call. But if you look at the song Savoy Shuffle, you know, he's listing off all these wonderful desserts and treats. So suddenly we've got a dessert theme for dinner that night when oh, yeah. we come back on board the ship. So, you know, you can just tie in your F&B cuisine, you know, to celebrate your day in Liverpool. And you talk about a cross-generational brand, you know, Jared's so young, he thinks the Beatles are classical music. So, I mean, you know, and, and yet there he is resonating with this story. So, well, so that's depending on what song you listen to, it is classical music. Because well. <laughs> sure they, they are already. classical music. <laughs> All right. We have another willing volunteer. Sebastian, you want to read us your story? No, no, I, I won't read it. I will invent it right now. But it's a true <laughs> story. Improv okay. to improv. I love it. And... Uh, I will. I would like to ask for two things first: that we don't talk anymore about diseases and prevention of COVID nineteen, <laughs> the quarantine, nothing. That for one moment we have a break. Huh? So le let us hear not not the recommendations that you separate the crew from this from that. No, let's be positive and look into the future. COVID has disappeared. Okay, uh, I will take you to a place. Uh, which is a real place uh, in Arica. Arica is a is a port in the north of Chile, in the border in, uh, with Peru and Bolivia. And uh, I was a few years ago president, vice president of the board of that port. And you have the three very different things that you have there. Arica is in the middle of the driest desert of the world. Driest, driest, nothing grows there. One. Second, you have the highest lake in the world, 5,500 meters above sea level. So, yes, in feet, uh, foot, you have to multiply by three, more or less. And the last, and the probably most important one, is that there is the Chinchorro culture. And the Chinchorro culture. It's a group of people that lived about 10,000 years ago. And they have there the oldest mummies on earth. They are 10,000 years old, 3,000 years older than the famous Egyptian Tutankhamun. 
And uh, I am very proud to say that I'm the first ambassador of the Chinchorro culture. And uh, one of the persons that is, uh, that is uh, participating in this, uh, in this uh, chat is uh, Victor Venegas, who, who was born there. Uh, and my question is, because those, those mummies will become uh, World Heritage very shortly by UNESCO. What comes to your mind? What, what would you say about that destination? Driest desert on earth, highest lake, oldest mummies, and you, you can say whatever you else you but but that that's the filet of the of the idea. Love it. Okay, gang. So I, I would ask um Victor uh, who is on here who says that Arica is his hometown. Yep. Um what what do you what what comes to mind for you about sharing this? Hi everyone, thank you so much for the question. Actually, it's a pleasure for me, and uh, thanks Sebastian for naming my city, my hometown. Uh, of course, the the first memory that comes is childhood, and uh, being by the ocean, uh, having this wonderful valleys in the middle of this driest desert in the world, um, enjoying the most wonderful olives that you mm -hmm. can taste in the whole world uh, and having uh, uh, an adolescence that in, in, in those days where you could go anywhere, anytime, either the beach or to the valleys, uh, until your mother in those days said, come on, it's time to get home. Now it's different. It's like everybody is in a computer or a telephone. Uh, in those days, it was free to roam the area with all your friends. You just showed up in a friend's home and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, about these mummies, I would love to encourage each one of you to uh, Google that and you will find out the most wonderful, wonderful culture that existed uh, 10,000 years ago. It's a long, long time ago. Thank you so much. All right, Jared, your hand is up. Go, my sure. friend. So when you first read that story with all those different with all those different elements, the desert and the really high lake and the mummies and everything, I my mind went to Indiana Jones, quite truthfully. <laughs> it's it's such a great setting for an adventure story where you can take the guests, you know, through through making them the main character, the protagonist of their of their own adventure story, going through all these different locales, or if they have a specific sort of interest that they uh, can designate three different experience pathways centered around these three different elements also, but several different narrative options that a guest can travel through. And there's, you know, different mysteries that they solve, different lessons that they learn, different moral conclusions, different morals that they learn as well. But there's so many different, with, with such a diversity of settings, there's so many ways to especially engage um, young people like me who also like to be a little bit active when they travel. Um, great ways to, to get the blood pumping and also get a great immersive history lesson that's a lot cooler than just a museum. So uh, great stuff, yeah. Wonderful, Duncan. Uh, well, you had me at dry desert because I have a telescope. So dry desert means no clouds, no clouds means beautiful star field. So the first thing I would do is I would work with the port to see, can we have a late night departure, maybe even an overnight? And that would allow us to shift a port excursion or shore excursion so that during the day, it's about the culture. It's a, maybe a visit up to the 5,000 foot high lake. Uh, and then we have an evening celebration where we're enjoying the cuisine. We've got storytelling. We're, we're, we're really having a chance to, through all of our senses, uh, ex experience this culture that we were unfamiliar with. And then we have the vastness of the night sky where we might be learning um, stories from the culture. I mean, if the mummies are 10,000 years old, then they probably had stories about the stars and the constellations and characters they saw in the stars and stories they told about the stars that we can transition to modern day science in terms of being able to see things with a naked eye and that kind of a wonderful night sky, uh, dark sky, nighttime setting that um, 
uh, people on a cruise ship enjoy seeing sometimes depending on the circumstances while they're sailing out to sea and they are you know in the in the dark vastness of the ocean but here we have a chance to put a cultural uh, embrace uh, around that or envelope around that experience great kelly so um uh once again talk to to just mention when we were in grand bahama working with them and um doing the culture mapping there to find out about um, all the different things to do um, one of the things we also learned was that um, through the, everybody there pretty much goes to church. So there was a way to reach everybody in that hmm. port, every adult and pretty much every child in that port, not just through the schools, not just through the hotels, um, but literally through through the churches. And so we, we built um, a, an enculturation package that allowed the locals to be able to share the culture that they wanted to promote to all of the guests that were incoming to all of the people on the island and in virtually everyone on the island was trained and didn't seem like training to them. It seemed like conversation and those kinds of things, but um, it really helped to bring attention to what the experience to, to be able to give the experience we wanted the guests to have. So just think about, you know, uh, sharing the culture that you want and making sure that everybody understands the brand you want your destination to, um, to, to wear every day as they're interacting with guests. Great notes. Great. Yeah, Duncan. Um, uh, not to pick on our friend here, but I think this is a really good example for people to see what we mean by story. And, and that is with the first two stories, there was an actual narrative journey that took us somewhere. And we were able to, using the theater of the mind, envision that we were somewhere else. And in using that as a, as a you know, sort of a, a, a simulator for our imaginations, we were able to then start to think and articulate about uh, different things that we could extrapolate from that story. Our friend gave us these three really good, unique, distinctive aspects of this destination. But um, it was Victor when he started talking about his childhood and started sharing some of those elements that we were able to, now we start to hear a little bit of that. Now, now that's starting to fire the reactor. So I think this is a great example. First of all, thank you so much for sharing the information about your destination, but it also underscores what the power of having that actual narrative story, even if it's only five or six sentences, what it allows your brain to start to do and how you can start to in, in, you know, live within that story and, and begin to start to, to, to play with it. Yeah, great point, Doug. And we got it from Sebastian. We got it. I got an overpowering sense of place. Never been there, but I got it right. And and from Victor, I got character. I got oh man, you know, to some extent that was my own childhood. I didn't live anywhere that exotic, but I mean, so when I merge those together, what I hear is this is a this is a place you can go to have a once in a lifetime experience to reconnect you with what it means to be human. Um, you know, across time, across distance. I mean, you can get out here and, you know, you can literally touch in on your fellow humans from thousands of years ago and, and look at the sky they looked at and look at the earth they walked and walk on the earth they walked on and really touch in with it. And I'm going to argue these days, you know, uh, no disrespect to technology, but, you know, it's interesting, right? The, the more digital stuff we had, the more people are willing to pay to go hear an actual band play live or go to a real theater. I think the same thing about destination experience. This is, this is viscerally real. And I would argue uh, it would not be a stretch, again, from a brand standpoint, from what's that core narrative, wouldn't be a stretch at all to say, you have an opportunity to come change your life, give it a shot, because it really would be. It'd be transformational for people to get to go and do that. Uh, your mind. If, I could, if I could knock onto that, um, Right there is a thread to where the experiences that we want to share with our guests connect them with that primal sense of being. So that it, it as you said, Bob, it's very visceral, very sensory driven, very, very root level experiences that get down to the hone of essence of existence and being that, as Kelly was saying, transitions across space and time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I try to, I try to make it as short as possible, because if I started like Victor telling the stories of my mother and my father, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, maybe we'll get back to you, Sebastian. I'd kind of like to hear those. We we might we might even email you a bottle of wine to get you to tell them. 
Uh, <laughs> hey, can we have one more one more story before we before we move along? Would love to have just one more. Somebody, I can see a lot of dark frames, so I can't see if you're sticking your thumb up if you don't have your camera on. Um, you could uh, uh, enter it in chat. Or you, or you can type it in the chat. That's fine. Yep. That'd be good, too. Come on. One more story, you guys. I can continue with my mother if you guys <laughs> <laughs> OK, there's one. Who is it, Kelly? <laughs> oh, sorry. Laura? Uh, Laura Campbell. All right. Laura Campbell. Yay. Um, I'm, I'm going to give this a go after listening to Karen's one. I feel slightly unprepared. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm based in Dartmouth in South Devon in the UK. And you may have heard of us, a little sort of known sailing as the Mayflower. So uh, we, we've had an interesting year this year. But I think for me, listening to everything and trying to sort of put something together here is, so we're, we're a natural harbour. Um, we, we welcome ships from the Crusades. So the crusading ships actually left from Dartmouth. We were the home of Francis Drake. Francis Drake also lived along our river Dart and sort of sailed out for his adventures. We have the Mayflower stories. We move right forward to World War II. Operation Tiger was round the corner from us. We've got this whole story of history and heritage, that whole adventure, the whole excitement of our river heading out into the, into the sea and the ocean. Um, I can take you to the museum and let you meet Wally. And Wally will tell you the story of when he was a child out along Slapton Sands, where they had to enforce leaving the houses that these people had lived in just because of the military occupation there so they could go through this sort of practice run for Operation Tiger. We've got the films that shows the women looking at the houses, never knowing when they're going to get back to their homes again. Some never actually did. They were away from their homes for two whole years while this exercise was going on. The, that, that sort of feeling of sense and place and loss and belonging, it, it's a real emotional journey. And what we've done is we're bringing it forward. You can actually get on a kayak and go all the way up river to a vineyard. You can see the seals. We have the seals joining in, whether you're on a paddleboard, a kayak, or some sort of a boat or vessel. For me, the story is all about that adventuring, the exploring. So going right back in history from all the people that are associated for our, our sort of little corner of the world, going out all those sort of maritime history and heritage down to what we can do now and see let alone, you know, the beautiful green sort of countryside around us, very sort of quintessentially British. We're the home of one of the best cream teas in Devon and don't get me started on Devon and Cornwall and cream teas. Um, you know, we've got the fish and chips, we've got the beers, we've got all of that with such a heart and soul of the food and the industry. But there's so much that's time, that's stepping back in time, you know, we've got our local guides that are local people, storytellers, and we really want, you can, you can actually go back and see buildings that were around in the 17th century. You can actually be there and experience it. And, and we're going through a little bit of a reshake up, a rebrand and, and getting our message out. So this is why one of these sessions interested me. So that's our little town of Dartmouth. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, these are so good. And now I'm just like, I want to go everywhere. Duncan. <laughs> um, uh, the first thing that comes to me is the word seafaring. You have this incredible seafaring heritage and legacy going back a thousand years. So um, we were working on another project up, up in Norway uh, in Kristiansand. And uh, a big part of that was the shipbuilding. And so uh, making part of either it's a shore excursion or part of you know the, your, 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 your drive radius who's coming to visit, being able to see how you build wooden ships, you know, with no nails, using the wood, you know, using the, the, the mallets and, and the, the, the wooden plugs. Um, we went to see a shipbuilder and it was just a riveting experience, let alone 
having an active ship that they're const that's constantly yeah. in a state of build. And as a guest, I get to put on a couple of boards. I get to steam a board to get it to its shape. So I have a tactile, hands-on experience helping to build a boat. I get my picture taken next to it. I don't know if the boat's going to ever sail or not, but it's in a perpetual state of being constructed. But from a guest experience standpoint, I learned how to steam oak. I learned how to bend it into the shape. I learned how to build it. I can see the way that the evolution of building boats has transitioned over the years because it's been a thousand year history for Dartmouth and the harbor that you have and your, your, your seafaring history. I love the access points for the Crusaders, for Sir Francis Drake, for World War II. But to me, what you have is this seafaring heritage, which is immediately a, a, a touch point for people who live in seafaring communities elsewhere around the world. So they're going to immediately be interested in your seafaring culture because they have a coming, whether it's from France or Norway or other coastal cities, they come from a similar tradition or it's people inland who just like to fish and, and enjoy being on the water. I think that would be a great experiential touch point to, 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 to really uh, 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 differentiate yourself uh, from other destinations especially, you know, the waterfront destination. Southampton is Southampton. They're, they're, they're stuck with all the big metal ships. You're going back to the wooden ships. You, you know what I mean? Cornwall, they got roundhouses. Okay, big deal. Roundhouses and Brussels sprouts. Okay. But, you know, I, and I'm not poo-pooing Cornwall. I don't know who else is on the call. That's my bad. I lived in London a long time ago as a kid, so my bad. But anyways, but yes, yeah, seafaring, seafaring, seafaring. Wonderful. Jared, you got something? Charles? Yeah, I would... I would definitely say um, with all of those great historical stories um, that, that, that you have going on there, there's such a rich lore to draw from and the kind of attractions and experiences you have. It sort of reminds me of, of, of a park that we're doing uh, in the Dominican Republic right now that's very near the coast um, that sort of takes cues from all these different uh, piratical explorers and, and, and great expeditioners throughout history and sort of melds it also with, with the local culture, those that live with the land there, which you also seem to have a very a very strong component of people who um, have, have a culture derived from the land as well. So creating um, an experience, a themed experience of that nature, whether it's whether it is a theme park, whether it is a, a, a sort of theatrical dinner environment, or whether it's just sort of a, a, a port experience where there's all these different people representing different eras of history kind of coming together as a crossroads where you hear all this live storytelling going on with you sort of harkening back to a little bit more uh, a, a little bit more refined version of the cosplaying stuff that we heard earlier just a great opportunity for that and a great way to get people interested in history in a way that's almost like walking into a, a historical video game somewhat sort of sense so uh, great great chance great chances to to play up those stories in immersive ways super great. anybody else I would, I'd like to jump on that. I, I think that um, the we've mentioned interactors um, several times and literally what that means is people who are dressed up and they are living a part and they live that part no matter what. Um, they don't break from the story when they're in that. And um, that that to me is a way to get not only your, um, your local culture involved, the local people involved, um, because I'm, I'm betting that as much as you know about it, um, probably there are people in your local culture who don't know, or if they do, they know one of the stories or one piece of the history. So being able to um, be able to get your hands, your arms around that and get that, um, uh, it sounds like you have a lot of history there from a <laughs> lot of different time periods. And so to be able to, um, to help them to know and understand it, what that is so that they can better um, deliver experiences regardless whether they're working in one of those historical places i i think about um we we rebranded the pocono mountains here um not not too far from uh new york city a few years ago and one of the things we learned there was it's a it's a four county area it's not it's not very big 2400 square miles it's it's i mean you know i i guess from a small country um it seems it seems like it's pretty big but it's not that big but yet people didn't know literally what was going on in, you know 10 miles away they didn't understand this they knew the history of their little town but they didn't know the history um down the road so one of the things that you know you can do is to is to um have storytelling nights where people where you invite um the public um most importantly the um the hospitality workers in in the area together to come and tell the story of what they're what they're 
um, part of the history is and what their destination um, is like. And, and it, gets, um, it gets everybody involved. Um, so just an idea. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, you had mentioned about the, um, uh, the, the, the cream tea and fish and chips. Um, one thing that not only you, but everybody here um, for your destination is to think of demonstration cooking so that um, as part of the show element of your destination, whether it's a portable food cart uh, or you have a stand, but it's not cooking the food to sell it, it's inviting guests to follow the cooking process. So there's, it, it's an actual interactive experience. There's a retail component to it where, and if you like what you're smelling, we've got the spice package right here that you can just take on board the ship and do it at home. Here's a recipe book. If you want to taste it, we've got it for sale right over here. But it's, it, it's not just an F&B stand. It's a show stand where food happens to be the entertainment, uh, at the entertainment element. And so, you know, when you're talking about making a good, you know, good fish and chips, you know, you know, besides the news wrap to, 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 to you know, bundle it up <laughs> and properly afterwards and, and the malt vinegar, very important, but um, is, uh, you know, the batter. How do you make a good batter so it clings to the fish? It makes it nice and crispy because maybe you don't like fish, but you want to cook chicken or you want to learn how to deep fry something else like that and, or to pan fry it, whatever it may be. But de demonstration cooking is a great way to immediately add a show element that has a retail component and an F&B component as part of it. And every place has its own different recipes. So let's showcase those flavor profiles. Let's showcase those taste combinations, those spice ingredients. And, and, and you know, if I can taste it, then automatically I've got a memory that I'm going to carry with me. Awesome. Okay, one, we got one more brave storyteller. Vanilla, let's hear your story. Make sure Vanilla, you want to Vanilla, you've got to unmute yourself. All right, here we go. All right, you guys, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So, so yes, everyone, I'm Danella. While I don't represent, I, I don't work for a destination, I am actually uh, representing the destination and kind of helping them tell their story in video right now. So I put together a little poem and uh, to, to kind of paint the picture and welcome any feedback to, to help us further tell their story, if you will. So here we go. Um, you know you were in this city even with your eyes closed because of the people. The soul of this city is inseparable from its people. You can hear the love in their expressions. You can see the skill in their architecture with carriageways and courtyards that take you back to Spain and rows of shotgun houses that recall the city's Afro-Caribbean heritage. You can get a taste of their passion in the city's culinary traditions. Boiled crawfish and soft shell crab, gumbo and stewed greens, bread pudding, and sweet pralines. The city chefs feed more than your appetite. They feed your spirit. And you can feel this city's joys and struggles in the jazz, the jump, and the gospel, as well as the blues that play long into the night. So look around and get to know the places, the flavors, the sounds, and most of all, the people of this city that some call the Big Easy. Anybody Can I say something? Right. Great job. <laughs> there was no question about that. One of my favorite cities in the world. Absolutely. So guys, what do you hear there? A tuba. <laughs> <laughs> A tuba. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pomp, 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 pomp. Guy with an umbrella yeah, leading the line, you know. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this, this, you're having that tuba as your music bed underneath the whole, you know, video you're putting together, just because that immediately, you know, that, that says Nola, you know. Uh, I could smell the chicory coffee and what you had with the, with the, with your poem going. You know, I was hearing somebody shaking up the beignets in the bag before they're getting ready to serve them. Uh, it, that, that, that's awesome in the video. I guess, um, the, you know, you said you're making this for a video, that's correct? Yes. A video to promote the city. Um, I guess what I would, um, uh, what I would, you know, love to tell is post Katrina, 
the infusion of uh, people who have come back to the city. You know, there, there, there was an enrichment in the Houston area that, that they are just thriving from because of the exodus uh, at post Katrina. But, you know, NOLA has rebounded and, you know, the, the um, you, you've got, uh, you know, the magazine district and across that, the mm -hmm. Irish Quarter, which is blowing up real big. So, I mean, there, there's a, there's, New Orleans is full of life and, and vigor again. And so, you know, this is an ongoing story of a city for, you know, 300 some years or so. And, you know, it's, this is a journey it has been on in perpetuity. And so what's happened is still part of this culture that is absorbing and growing and blossoming. Yes, there's some favorites that have, you know, impacted it over the years that are, you know, become its staples, but what are the new staples? You know, what is the new New Orleans? I guess, I, you know, because mm -hmm. you know what the favorites are, but right. you know, what's the new New Orleans to get, especially, you know, Zillennials, uh, getting them to come and be interested in the city because, I mean, if you're an older generation, then you're all about Mardi Gras, you know, or the Jazz Festival or whatever it might be. But from a Zennial standpoint or Zillennial standpoint, how do you merge those two groups together? You know, the young worker snappers, you know, what, you know, what is the new New Orleans and, and what might be enticing to them? Cool. Nice. Other thoughts? Right. Kelly? I just have um, one quick thought, and that is, um, having been to New Orleans not as many times as Duncan, because he goes to Mardi Gras every year, um, but when I have been, um, New Orleans, as, as quote-unquote small of a city as it is, there's so much to do. And so being able to tell a story of, of a few things I can do or a few other things I can do and have maybe have them, I don't know if they tie together, if they are a little bit of everything, but if I had a clean and easy quote unquote path through the city, um, not literally, but um, mm -hmm. as a story uh, path, if you will, that would be really helpful for me. Nice. Yeah, I guess the, the other thing I would just real quick knock on to that is to me, <laughs> New Orleans is uh, you can't get to the bottom of it. It is it is a spiraling magical place that you you could spend your life and never plumb the depths of all the cultures. You know, metaphorically, every turn, every street corner, every alley, you know, every storefront is this invitation to a completely different universe that you cannot find anywhere. My my favorite brand, and I use it as an example all the time when we do destination branding. I say of New Orleans, it is the one place in the United States that ain't in the United States. It is, it is absolutely its own thing. And I know, and I feel your pain because <laughs> describing New Orleans to somebody who's never been there is like trying to tell somebody what an oyster tastes like. It's just like, you know, but, but it is absolutely have a lot of fun with your, your video. Here's the other great thing about New Orleans. You can't possibly hurt it. You can't possibly get it wrong. So, mm -hmm. so so if you have an instinct, well, maybe I ought to say that. The answer is yes, say that. Yeah, don't pull, don't pull any punches. We're talking about New Orleans here. So, all right, look, that, you guys, for all those of you who volunteered. May I say something? Thank you a ton. Oh, I'm really sorry, especially. We got to keep moving or we're not going to make our time. And you guys have other commitments. Um, but I'll tell you this, that was, that was brave work. I hope that was a little snack about how stories can help you do design. Um, we're going to finish up. Uh, we're not going to give you death by PowerPoint like we did last last uh, Monday, but we do want to finish up with a few, just a few points to try to to bring this home for everyone. So uh, bear with me while I grab my my screen here. Um, and, I, and I want to start here. Um, you know, this is this is not uh, po poetry. This is uh, truth. Um, you know, you really do rule the world when you control the story. You know, don't. Don't ever think that your guest experience doesn't have a story. It absolutely does. It could be that it's not one you're actively telling, and that's something we need to remedy. You know, you want to be the one driving that narrative. You want to tell the story that you want told. By the way, quick note, the very best stories in the world are never hampered by facts. There is a difference between an authentic, genuine, honest story and one that's all fact-based. Um, some of the greatest stories in the world don't have, a, don't have an objective fact in them, but they're very, very true. So don't hesitate to talk the way you all spoke today about this is how it could be. This is what could happen to you. That's fine. You know, if, if, 
if sending people data points would get them to your destination, we wouldn't be online because you guys would be all full all the time because that's really easy. All right, a few things just I want to recap. And then if there, if there are questions, we'll answer and then we'll guys let you go because there's a lot more C trade out there. Um, let's start again with that all important audience who's coming. So we want you to design for your audience. Um, and remember too, Gens and Zs, uh, between the two of them, they represent 53% of the Earth's population. They are your future, um, not your past. D don't exclude all of us old folks. We love to go places too, but you know, really think about what's that Instagrammable adventure? What's that grammable pick? You know, no pick or it didn't happen, right? So what is that? And what do you have? And you have it. So start making that list. What's that Instagrammable adventure that we can show that nobody else is gonna be able to, to, to offer? Design for distinction. Um, I'm, if there's anybody from Virgin on, online, this is homage, it's not criticism. I, I think Virgin Voyages, uh, and we've got some good friends there, has done a phenomenal job of branding. No kids, no kidding. They're very clear about who they think their guest is. Um, if you're a Disney Cruise Line guest, you're probably not a Virgin Voyages guest. That's great. That's no problem. Take family, go on Disney Cruise, have a great time. You want to come for kind of a really cool adventure with you and your bestie or you and your significant other or you by yourself if you want. Come aboard. We got this, right? So, so again, I told you I would reiterate this when we started. Please don't fall for, for the trap of something for everybody. It's just a, it's just a bad idea. Um, nobody wants that. They don't. They want you to embrace them. They want you to say, you, we want you. We love you. We're where you want to go, right? Do that, you know? Um, and one of the things that we see where we see this, I mean, I love this quote, um, you know, all around expedition cruising, which we had dipped our toe in the pond, no, no pun intended, a couple of years ago with a client, you know, fascinating. I honestly, to be real straight up with you, I'm not like a big cruiser. I would do an expedition cruise. I am that target. They they had me at hello, and if I could just rob a bank, I would go on one. But um, uh, they are they are really really focused on who their guest is. Be focused on who your guest is. Design for somebody. Design for that one big thing that you can offer that nobody else gets to. We talked about this, but we'll nail it one more time. See this lady? She'd love to play with you, but doesn't know how, and she's fed up. She's going to go home. She's mad, and she's going to write bad things on TripAdvisor. So you know. It doesn't matter how great your experience is. If it's too hard for people to do, they won't do it. And hard includes intimidation. Well, I don't know. I'm a little afraid. To, I don't know who to ask. There was no sign. I didn't see it. Maybe we better not. You don't want that. You, you want to make it effusively easy to engage all the delicious stuff that you have. You know, make it really simple. By the way, usually operationally, things are really simple. It's getting the guests, particularly the cruise passenger, over that hump. I mean, it's an astounding statistic, and you all know it probably to the, to the decimal point better than I do. But in, in many of the destinations we've worked on, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of guests in a lot of ports never get off the ship. Um, you know, it's because it's not easy. It's because it's intimidating. It's not because they don't want to. Uh, they want to. But give them, give them a reason to. And I love this quote from Clea, access is the new luxury, you know, make it easy, make me part of the club and I'll go, I'll go do it and I'll have to run as fast as I can when I hear that, that horn honk uh, at departure because I'm going to be having so much, so much fun. How big, and I use big in quotes, it's a metaphor for size, design for people. You know, sometimes a little bit of extra space, a little bit of quiet, a little bit of breathing is just what the doctor ordered. We think about uh, Sebastian and Victor's story. One of the things that appealed to me about that was spaciousness. Uh, there's no there's no lines I have to stand in out there, you know. So so uh, and that that's what this 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 guest comment is all about. So you know, and this is not a COVID thing. This is a, a human thing. Cramp spaces, long lines, a lot of noise I can't get away from. No place to go hide, you know. Social distancing, not COVID, just do I always have to be around all these people all the time? Is it safe? Am I going to get shot or can I really go down that intriguing looking alley? These are all things that you need to think about as you're designing that experience. And, and by the way, clear-headed design, not, not, not papering things over. If there is an issue, then you have to address it. 
You have to say, well, yeah, it's, that side of town's a little dicey. We're going to send you with a guide. She's going to take care of you. Don't worry about a thing. We got you covered. But you really want to think about the fact that, you know, it's not about the ground and it's not about facilities. It's about the people. And also, you know, this notion of, of value proposition, right? People increasingly, you know, and we use the Gen Z example, who as a generation right now have not amassed a, a great deal of personal wealth, but they're more than willing to inordinately spend on things that they value and things that they consider important, on things they consider enriching for their lives. Um, you know, this is a great quote from Walt Disney, who is certainly one of my mentors. Um, you know, you don't build it for yourself. You find out what people want, you build it for them. Sounds very simple-minded, but so much design um, in so many destinations doesn't start with the guests. So you got you to say, you know, if, if we build this right, we can charge a fair price. You can sometimes charge a premium by, by engineering less, by, by, by removing the barriers between the guest and that absolute visceral experience that they really want to have. So to wrap up, we actually do have a method for doing all this. And again, we were sort of sampling it today. Uh, I, won't make your, I won't read this to you, you can read, but there is a process. Um, lots of people have them. We find it's important to start where you are and then in a very, very detailed and, and, and very, very rich way, do what we did a little bit of today, really create that optimal narrative, decompose that design story into a plan that's executable and actionable. And again, no, no offense if you happen to be one, but it's, it's not the same thing as an architectural rendering. Um, it's not a pretty picture, it's a plan. It's go do these things in this order, this way, please. And when you do that right, and you combine that with good rational market analysis, we can even say, and don't spend more than this much money and do them in this order and you can charge this much. That's all knowable. So we can do that if, if we're expert at this. You do lots of testing, lots of refinement. You don't get married to your plan too early. Then you implement before you ever go out to the market, please teach your staff who are gonna live your brand and wear it around how to do that. How do, you, how do they get in that story? How do they wear that story right on their sleeve? Because that will help them know how to take care of your guests. And then, and then you're ready to go really turn this story on in the marketplace and make it real active and put it where people can get at it. So a few, few last pointers now that you're all um, storytellers and you are, uh, you demonstrated that today. In the story you're telling about your destination, you're the hero. You really are the hero. Um, you can make the guest the hero if you want, but it's really you. So remember that you're going out there into the world, the world's your stage. You write that play the way you want it to go. Uh, and then you get to control the action in it. Um, if you find things getting difficult, um, you might want to say, let's check our story. You know, organizations, brands, destinations, that doesn't really matter what kind of an enterprise you're running. When they began to lose focus on the narrative that made them what they are, the story that really powered them up and compelled you to make the choices that you made and do the things that you did, you know, let's face it, you know, we're not talking here about um, medical research or nuclear reactor technology. We're in the human business. The, we all, for some weird reason, chose to be in the entertainment business. And you know, that's about taking care of folks. So, so if you start to get skinny, if you start to feel a little wan and peek it out there, go check your story. Sometimes we lose touch with our story um, and you gotta go refresh it. You gotta go bring it back to life. Sometimes the world changes underneath you and you say, you know what? That's not the story anymore. We need a new story. And then you make one. You, you, you start right back at ground zero. You make that story and then you pump that energy back in there. But if you don't think your story is fresh and you haven't looked at it recently, there, there's a warning shot there, uh, and it, it could be reflected in symptoms you're having. And this is the I love this one, you know. But I'm not a storyteller. I'm a Shorex executive. I'm a tour guide. I am a hotelier. I'm a restaurateur. I, yes, you are. Yeah, you don't get off that easy, particularly now. You, you all, of course, uh, uh, of all people, because you can't fool us anymore. We know you're all storytellers. You just proved it. Heck, you spent 90 minutes out of an otherwise perfectly good day when you could have been doing things productive, listening and playing with us, because you're storytellers. So you are, I don't care what role you play and what it says on your business card, you're a storyteller, particularly when it comes to your own enterprise. 
So remember this, when you go out there, every time that guest steps ashore, every time that guest steps aboard, every time that guest steps into your lobby or up to your restaurant podium, every time they talk to one of your, your employees, you are entering a dialogue, you're entering a human myth with that guest, that's sacred space. You just entered sacred space. So if you don't wanna do it for business reasons, and if you don't wanna do it because it's fun, because it is fun, do it out of a sense, a sense of ethical obligation to your species. You, you, you have the, the, the requirement to uphold that sacred space. Do that. Your branded experience at the end of the day is a story. You are the teller of it and the orchestrator of it, and you can make sure it turns out really great for you uh, and your guest. So we're pretty close to time. A uh, couple of points. We all know the story about the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Well, you can get there, but you gotta find the rainbow first and you gotta get to the rainbow. And maybe you have to climb over some scrub to get there. So if you're gonna go there, the thing is this, it's going to take effort to do this, to do the things we've been talking about, to implement these things, yeah. It requires funding, it requires money, it requires effort, it requires time, it requires human resources. Yep, we get it. And we know times have been a little bit skinny. What we'd ask you to contemplate though is what's the cost of not doing this? Because the world's not gonna be the same ever again. It never has been, by the way, but it clearly isn't gonna be the same. What's the cost of not taking a little bit of an inflection here and taking care of this and really looking at it? So, so we'll leave that with you as a provocative question. So speaking of questions, Mark, uh, I don't know if we have any questions. If we do, we'll try to answer them. And if we don't, uh, if you have one, now's a good time to text it to so or chat it so we can see it. Yep. Um, yep. Go ahead, Kelly. I was going to say there is some clarification, um, um, and I know that it differs by port, but uh, you mentioned how many people, the percentage of people that never even get off the ship. Mm -hmm. Could you, somebody ask for you to clarify that? Well, sure. The, the numbers that we have encountered when we've done research, and it's not super, super primary research, but any, anywhere from 20% to, to even as high as 40%, and it, depend, it does depend on the port, and it depends on where the, where, the, um, where the hailing port is. You know, it depends where the home port was. Um, again, different cultures are different, you know. Um, a first-time cruising couple in their 60s who's never been on a ship before from Kansas City, Missouri, in the United States, is less likely to get off a ship in a fairly exotic port than somebody, say, from the Netherlands, who's cruised 16 times and is used to getting around the world. So it depends on who it is, but, but it is a higher, I, I was stunned when I heard that as many as at least 20% don't even, don't even get off the ship in a port. To the extent that when we were first working with Disney Cruise Line, because we were still part of the company then, we literally had to create a whole bunch of media to get guests to get off the ship, to propel them off the ship so they'd go take advantage of the ports of call. Uh, others, any other questions? No, no other questions to this point, Bob. Thank okay, great. Guys. Well, we're good to go. Uh, it's been an absolute delight to have you with us today. And for those of you who stayed in Monday through Wednesday, um, you should all get a trophy. We, we sure appreciate it. It's great to, to engage, even if we have to do it to distant wise like this, maybe next year we all get to go shake hands and, and uh, eat some of that fish and chips and have one of those pints we were talking about. Thanks a ton for your attention. Um, we are here. Um, these are our stats. And you can certainly connect with Mark and, and I and the rest of the team through the uh, uh, Sea Trade Cruise Virtual um, app. And we'd love to follow up with you uh, anytime we can. So thanks again for attending. Be safe. Enjoy the rest of your Sea Trade experience. And we hope to see you soon.